we have an uh, exciting debate uh, before us on science advice, what works in a crisis. And we have a very distinguished uh, panel with us uh, today uh, who will give short talks in succession. And in the second part of the webinar, uh, we shall have a, uh, a debate answering questions that you bring up and commenting on various points that have come up during the introductory talks. So as I said, we have a very distinguished panel with us today. Uh, our first speaker will be uh, Pearl Dijkstra, who is the Deputy Chair of the European Commission's Group of Chief Scientific Advisors. Then we have Orvin Wren, who was the Chair of the SAPIA uh, Working Group on MASAS, which is an acronym standing for Making Sense of Science uh, Under Conditions of Uncertainty, Complexity and Ambiguity. And then we have David Mayer, who is the head of unit at the EU Commission's uh, Joint Research Center. We are delighted to have with us Christian Wuppen, who is the chair of the European Group on Ethics in Science and New Technologies. And we have uh, Professor Janusz Bunicki, uh, former uh, member of the Group of Chief Scientific Advisors. And Tamo Soomera, the president of the Estonian Academy of Sciences. And finally, uh, Sir Mark Walport, uh, former Chief Scientific Advisor to the UK government. My name is Ole Peterson. I'm the Vice President of Academia Europea, and it is my privilege uh, to chair this event. We can have the next slide, please, Toby. So just two words about SAPIR. But anyway, uh, SAPIR is a organization funded by the uh, uh, European Commission. It consists of five principal uh, networks, pan-European networks, and in alphabetical order, these are uh, Academia Europea, Federation of European Academies of Medicine, uh, European Academies Science Advisory Council, the Federation of European Engineering Academies, Eurocase, and uh, ALEA, or European uh, Academies. And these uh, organizations together provide evidence review reports in response to requests from the uh, European Commission. These evidence review reports are then the basis for scientific opinions uh, expressed by the group of chief scientific advisors. And the important point is that both the evidence review reports and the scientific opinion are published and are in the public domain so that everybody can see what uh, the evidence is and what advice has been given. And in my final slide, if it can be brought up, uh, I know it is there, thank you. Uh, clearly, while COVID-19 is not part of the title of this event, it's clear that at this point in time, uh, COVID-19 is one of the most important considerations for all governments and therefore also for advisors. And this uh, sort of graphic does not uh, pretend to be the complete uh, description of all the different things that have to be taken into account, but it does show uh, a, a number of important considerations that have to come in, illustrating that uh, multidisciplinary advice is uh, absolutely essential uh, in a crisis like this. And this, of course, is a very, very major crisis. Almost one million people have died uh, in the course of this event. So it's a really, really uh, big event which has touched essentially everybody uh, on this globe. This obviously has been challenging for scientific advisors and will continue to be challenging for scientific advisors because we are obviously by no means at the end of this crisis, rather in the middle of it. And what I think has also further complicated uh, the life for many scientific advisors is that we are dealing with a variety of different, I would say, kinds of governments in the, in the world at the moment. On the one hand, we have uh, dictatorships, some of them competent, uh, some of them incompetent. And on the other hand, we have democracies, again, sometimes uh, ruled by competent politicians, and in other case, quite frankly, by rogue politicians. And clearly, this 
is and must be challenging for science advisors. They clearly cannot behave and operate in the same way in all these uh, different uh, climates. So I won't say any more at this point in time because it's very essential that we keep the time and we are right now exactly on time. So we will start uh, the talks, the short talks, and I kindly ask each presenter to stay within that time because otherwise we will not have uh, too much time for the debate. So it's a great pleasure to ask uh, Professor Pearl Dijkstra, uh, Professor of uh, Empirical Sociology at the Erasmus University in Rotterdam, and as I said, Deputy Chair of the European Commission's Group of Chief Scientific Advisors to give the first talk in this series. So the floor is yours, Pearl. Thank you, Ole, for your uh, gracious introduction. Let me start by telling you, the audience what my angle in this panel discussion will be. As Ola said, I'm one of the seven chief scientific advisors to the European Cabinet, so I will be speaking from that experience. Somewhere in May, we decided that it was time to take, to take stock of what we had learned and to provide a statement on giving scientific advice concerning the ongoing going coronavirus crisis. The statement, published in June, is the joint work of the European Commission's Group of Chief Scientific Advisors, the European Group on Ethics, and its chair, Christiane Wuppen, is also on today's panel, and Peter Piot, Special Advisor on COVID to President Ursula von der Leyen. The statement draws upon principles generated in an earlier opinion published in September 2019, and the title of that opinion is Scientific Advice to European Policy in a Complex World. And that opinion, in turn, leaned heavily on an evidence review carried out by SAPEA. And the title of that review is Making Sense of Science Under Conditions of Complexity and Uncertainty. Ola referred to that evidence review. And a key author is with us today, I hope he is, um, <laughs> Oth Vinten. I will highlight two points. The first is about communicating uncertainty. Scientific knowledge of a pandemic such as COVID-19 is often preliminary, limited, and changes over time. Communicating uncertainty, that's what's known, partially known, unknown, and unknowable, to policymakers and to the public at large can be difficult, but is essential if trust in politicians and their advisors is to be maintained. It's not enough for politicians to say they are following the science. They need to understand the uncertainty in the science and its relation to recommended measures and to communicate that to the public well. Trust is particularly critical if the public are to have confidence in their political leaders and is especially required when onerous demands are made on personal behavior. Trust is only possible if the scientific advice given by official advisors is open and transparent and is based on the highest quality of evidence. Being open and transparent allows the evidence upon which the advice is based to be publicly assessed, and it makes clear whether political leaders indeed take the science seriously. And if they're not, it forces them to justify their actions. Being open also allows other scientists to challenge evidence and interpretation. The public and politicians need to appreciate that scientific knowledge evolves and improves, and that new understanding of the disease and of the societal impact may lead to changes in policy direction. Note the differences of views between scientists can serve as an early warning for the public authorities, which indicates that more discussion and analysis are required. Yet, diverging scientific opinions can be confusing for both politicians and the public. However, the solution is not to hide differences of opinion, but rather to force them into the open and clarify why there's a range of scientific opinions and ethical assessments. This brings me to the second point, 
about boundaries between scientific evidence, scientific advice, and politics. A critical factor is clarity about the responsibilities in the networks from researchers to scientific advisors to political leadership. The reasoning applied by scientific advisors when bridging the gap between evidence and policy recommendations should be explained. This should include the assumptions made, normative positions taken, as well as the limitations and uncertainties encountered. Clarity should also cover the demarcation of advisory versus decision-making roles and for insurance, ensuring that the public, public messaging is carried out correctly. This is necessary so the scientific case is not distorted by the messaging and that scientists are not used as cover for politicians who are the ones ultimately responsible for policymaking. Finally, it should be recognized that politicians sometimes have to make difficult decisions and that they may choose not to follow the scientific advice. But if they do so, they should make that clear and group their reasons for not following the advice. And I'm gonna leave it at this, but I will end with a question for the audience. And the question reads, do you feel your government is sufficiently transparent about the scientific evidence underlying its corona crisis policies? Thank you. Thank you very much, Pearl, for this, uh, I think, and for staying so well on time. Uh, that's excellent. Unfortunately, as far as I can see, Ortwin Wren is not with us. So I think we have to move on to the uh, following speaker, which is David Mayer. And I hope that uh, you are mentally prepared for stepping in now, uh, David. So David Mayer is the head of unit of uh, science advice to policy and the European Commission's Joint Research Center. And uh, I will give you the floor now, David, uh, for five minutes. Thanks very much, Ole. I hope you can hear and see me. Is that okay? Yes, yes Great. that's fine. So um, what can we say? Well, Corona is a kind of perfect storm for science advice because we have enormous uncertainties, but we also have a pretty full spectrum impact on all of our economies and societies across the board. So this is always going to be massively challenging to science advice. So the good news, if we can, if we can learn some lessons from this, then it should work in many other areas. Although, of course, it's, it's still very early to tell what these lessons are. So these are very much personal uh, and provisional remarks. So Corona appears to have exacerbated several things that we have been talking about for years. Uh, in addition to uncertainties in the science, we've had this explosion of scientific literature of variable quality and variable relevance. So it has been hard to find some solid ground in the evidence base. Uh, and the nature of this problem has also underlined how important interdisciplinary work is. We've seen the need for medical science, natural science, behavioral science, and social science. They need to work together, and I think we've seen that uh, we haven't yet cracked how to get that right. Um, but Corona has also highlighted simply how important scientific evidence is to public policy and scientists and their advice and the questions we're talking about now have been in the popular media in a way I've simply never seen before. Um, but it's clear that Corona has exposed uh, some of the fault lines in this question of science advice and evidence informed policy. And that was bound to be the case with such a, an all encompassing crisis. We put out a report last year called Understanding Our Political Nature, looking at the challenges of bringing science into policy. Uh, and some of my thoughts here are inspired by that. So uh, first thing, uh, it does seem to be hard to assemble a system of science advice in a crisis on, on the back of an envelope. So perhaps uh, the value of investing in capacity in systems of using science advice can uh, pay off. So we, we have just launched a series of workshops to see how we can improve the capacity for policies in the member states. And there have some, been some fantastic examples during the crisis of how to do it. But I hope that uh, one of the silver linings of this dreadful crisis is that it provokes some, some clear thinking about how to more strategically integrate scientific 
confidence and its provision uh, into government, but also connect up academies, universities, regulatory agencies better than we have done up until now. Uh, but it's one thing to talk about the systems, but you've also got to have people who are comfortable and skilled at this interface. And that is frankly not for everyone. So you need scientists who know their field and in particular are trusted by everyone in the field to represent their field. They're not just seen as taking one side or one theory, but they are respected across the board. That's going to be important. But these people also need to be comfortable with policymaking uh, and politics. And on the other side, we need policymakers who know how to ask for the right evidence to uh, appraise it and interrogate it and to communicate it uh, well to the public. Uh, as as uh, Pearl alluded to, trust, of course, is absolutely crucial. Trust in the science, but also scientists and trust uh, in governments. And as Pearl says, a lot of this is about scientific excellence. But what our report showed is it's excellence is not enough. Uh, it's perceived openness, honesty, uh, transparency. But also there has to be a community of interests and values between citizens and the scientists uh, and the politicians. Otherwise, the advice and them won't be accepted. This is going to be very hard when we are, there are, there are strong elements of political polarization. And this question, I think, is going to be crucial when we get around to hopefully having a vaccine and are looking at new uh, ways to introduce it. If we don't get to the bottom of these values and identities questions, then no amount of scientific evidence about the vaccine will persuade people to take it. Uh, how do you build this trust? Uh, well, in addition to all the good things Pearl said about openness and transparency, the thing that I think we are putting a lot of faith in is new techniques of deliberative democracy and citizen engagement, uh, bringing citizens into both the construction of the science, but also the policy decisions. Uh, and there is clearly a big dilemma to what extent can we trust citizens to wrestle with scientific uncertainty and disagreement. And it's been very, very interesting how all that backstage argument that scientists take for granted, it's been rather difficult for the public to see that exposed. But uh, my hunch is that we have to trust citizens more to be able to deal with the complexity and nuance and uncertainty than perhaps we give them credit for. Uh, and therefore, in conclusion, you know, scientific evidence, I think, has been proved to be not only necessary, but indispensable. But I think it's shown that if we want to actually change public policy, it's, it's not enough. We have to grapple with these questions of uh, identity, values uh, and emotions. And I think we have some good evidence in how to do that now. But I think it's probably better to move on to Christian Wupin first, just to give uh, Orvin a little bit of a chance to feel uh, his way into this uh, webinar. So it's now my pleasure to give the floor to Professor Christian Wupin, who is Professor of Ethics and Theory of Medicine at the University of Cologne and Director of course, the Cologne Center for Ethics, Rights, Economics, and Social Sciences and Health. So, Christian, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ole, and thank you for having me in this distinguished panel. So, um, my thesis is that science advice can only work in the crisis of a broad variety of scientists work together, as David already pointed out, and um, Pearl as well. So there's one single trigger for worldwide crisis, a tiny little virus. However, the effects are hugely manifold and the crisis is characterized by a broad variety of problems. They are the medical, economic, social, educational, cultural, political, communicative, psychological nature and so forth. And to manage a crisis like this pandemic adequately right from the beginning through different phases from extensive lack of knowledge at the beginning to growing evidence, but also changing findings and insights. It needs a broad spectrum of disciplines and expertise, and it needs a variety. Let's choose this kind of image of glasses, which cast a different light on the situation and through which people focus different aspects of the pandemic. And it needs different perspectives to raise the right uncomfortable questions in order to rethink strategies and specific measures all the time. And there was already a question in the 
um, yeah, in the chat, why people are forced back to normal only to keep the economy running while the evidence could perhaps point to another direction. We can discuss this later, perhaps. It is obvious that at the beginning, one wants to understand above all the virus and its effects. Thus, the virologists came in and their research and insights are especially important. But it is not obvious and quite astonishing for me that at least in some countries, there is still a dominance of virologists in the public debate. Of course, they can tell us how the virus works and how it spreads, but we need epidemiologists to discuss different models of the dynamic of the viral spreading. And we need clinicians to learn what the virus does to those people who are infected. We then need psychologists, social scientists, and economists in order to learn what a pandemic and the countermeasures do to individuals, societies, and the economy. Social inequality is a major problem, which will deeply influence the future of Europe, but it is not yet adequately reflected in the public debate. Also, but not only in this respect, we need ethicists to deal with the impact of the pandemic and the countermeasures on fundamental rights, freedoms and values, as David already alluded to. They also have specific expertise to deal with the complex trade-offs required in the face of difficult conflicts between different objectives, such as the one between saving human lives of those who have COVID-19 and providing care for those who suffer from other diseases but have no access to medical care. Or think about the conflict between the goal of reducing the spread of SARS-CoV-2 and the goal of keeping the economy and the educational system running. Here we learn that we still don't have an adequate reporting of numbers. It is not enough to mainly report the number of those infected, but these numbers are dominating the public reporting, the media um, news. We need to know how many tests are performed, how many people are seriously ill, how many people are in hospital and are ventilated, and how many die. Only then we have an adequate starting point to consider proportionate measures. We then need legal experts to find out whether political measures that touch upon several fundamental rights and freedoms are proportionate and so forth. Of course, I cannot mention the adequate contribution of every discipline. But to my mind, it is indispensable that all these perspectives come together and discuss the situation in all its complexity. So on every level where important political decisions are made, there should be a crisis management team or call it advisory board where all perspectives come together, where data are integrated, where networking happens and advice is developed. They also can contribute to communication with the public thus fostering participation, transparency, and trust, as was already mentioned. At least, to my mind, every state should have such a panel, ideally working together with a European team of the same kind, and that's why I'm very grateful that the European Group on Ethics is working together with a group of chief scientific advisors, chief science advisors, and Peter Piet. And I think that's a very valuable joint work. So my final question to all of you is, do you think that every country in a pandemic um, should implement a national pandemic advisory board that brings together a variety of different sciences for policy advice and public communication? Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, Christian, for this uh, valuable contribution. I think uh, Ortwin uh, probably has now been uh, connected sufficiently, but we may uh, hear from you. Welcome, Ortwin. Uh, uh, Ortwin Wren is the Scientific Director of the Institute of Advanced Sustainability Studies in Potsdam, uh, Germany, and as I mentioned in my own introduction, chaired the working group for uh, making sense of science that produced the evidence review report that also Paul Dexter referred to. So I'll give the floor to you, uh, Audrey, now for five minutes, please. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Ola, and thanks also uh, for introducing myself and uh, 
apology for a bit late to coming in because they had a couple of problems connecting directly uh, to our call, but now it succeeded. I would really like to refer to our report, and we have amplified four different functions of the science policy nexus. The first function was enlightenment, the second one was instrumental, the third one was strategic, and the fourth one was co-creationist or co-designing. And I think all these four different elements of scientific advice have made a very important contribution to the management of the present crisis. I start with the first one, enlightenment. I think this was basically the time where all the biologists and partially the epidemiologists came into play to just give people the understanding of what was happening, where the virus was coming from, what it was doing, how infectious the virus was, how lethal the virus was, all of these are background information. But there are other background information that came later on about potential side effects of protective measures, but also about the different perspectives. And I would like to point out that some of the controversy that you're seeing is the difference in perspective between the individual who sees how many people are dying individually and the more statistical, holistic perspective. And if you look, for example, a country like Germany, we have around 1% excess mortality until now. It is not that much. Other countries are much worse. But it's very interesting to see the top down, the bottom up perspective, because those give a different but uh, very uh, coherent picture of reality. The second point is instrumental. And I think, again, it was most of the health people that were strongly involved in this. The question is, how do I protect myself? And it was very clear from the beginning worldwide that there were basically the three things that you should do, keep distance, um, um, keep hygiene, and uh, make sure that you wear masks um, in an area where um, infection might be probable. And, um, and you know, there were simple messages in the sense, but it was very clear, and I think that was a part of the scientific measure to make sure that these simple messages came across to everyone. And I think there's not a single country in the world where this message, the kind of instrumental scientific message, has not been reinforced and has not been implemented. Uh, so in that sense, it's a, a remarkable story. Even some of the uh, political leaders who we think have, have a different um, priority list uh, came back to these kind of very simple instrumental. The third thing is strategic, and then it's getting more sophisticated. Um, and I think uh, um, what Christiane already pointed out is the trade-offs between the infection, the protection against the infection, saving lives uh, in a sense uh, through uh, keeping the infection from not spreading. And secondly, having the um, um, secondary impacts of all the protective measures. Um, well, they also have a major impact, not only on the economy, as many people say, they also have an impact on health, for example, that other people don't get the treaty, that if you get people to poverty, that has direct impact on life expectancy. So there were very complicated trade-offs to make. And I think that's the part where science is even best to do that, to at least make sure what are the implications of option one versus option B, and the likely side effect is all the uncertainty that are out there. Making these trade-offs is a question of decision makers, it's a political issue, but preparing these trade-offs is very important in terms of scientific advice. And there, and I would echo that what I've heard from the other speakers, integrative and interdisciplinary science is absolutely crucial because otherwise you can't make trade-offs because the various impacts are in different disciplines. And lastly is the co-creative part. And I think that has not been implemented as much as I would have liked it. A co-creative highs that we sit together with the major stakeholders and maybe also the citizen groups and to see what can we do given the insights from science in order to make your life more comfortable, to make clear that you can go beyond um, or, or your business or what it is. So to uh, co-create knowledge of orientation. There are two big advantages of this. You co-create a create ownership over it, and you don't have a lot of people who are against it because they have worked together with it. And secondly, it creates trust. And again, that was, as I think, made that point very clearly, 
So this co-creative method of scientists working as policymakers and with effective groups, in this case basically stakeholder groups, would help them to gain trust, but also to sustain trust between the various sections, even if measures are unpopular. So in the end, I would say that it's very important that we keep those four functions of the science policy making nexus very well functional, um, operational, because all four are highly demanded. And there's not one that has priority over the others. We see a little sequence from the enlightenment over the instrumental to the strategic, to the co-creative, but all four need to be done. And I think that the major element and a major contribution that science can really offer to the policy world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Audrey, for this uh, very good contribution. And we now move on to uh, Professor Janusz uh, Boniki, who is Professor of Biological Sciences at the International Institute of Molecular and Cellular Biology in Warsaw. Janusz, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, um, I would like to uh, shift gears and speak more about the interactions between scientists, policymakers, and the general public from the national perspective in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, first of all, um, to address the issue whether the general public sees good science for policy advice as important or not. And uh, I don't think from my perspective in Poland, I don't think that uh, the general public sees any uh, science or policy advice at all. Um, of course, there are groups of citizens who would like the government to use uh, the best possible scientific evidence, but um, my experience, uh, at least from Poland, is that most people care mostly about their deeply held beliefs and their values, and there's no easy way to address their concerns with uh, scientific advice. Um, I must say there's uh, an overall lack of trust in public institutions and services in Poland, including the healthcare system, which is important in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, mostly due to their low perceived quality compared to the expected quality rather than due to sort of political issues. Um, actually, uh, uh, a, a significant part of the general public does not trust the government at all and sees all or most of the regulations as vicious, oppressive, and certainly serving some clandestine evil purpose. So at the beginning of the pandemic, when the Polish Minister of Health um, indicated on the media that the face masks are not particularly recommended because there is no evidence for the utility against COVID-19, uh, people have stormed the stores and bought out all the masks that were there because obviously the communication must have had some uh, other side. On the other hand, shortly after the ministry changed the recommendations and made wearing the masks mandatory, Many people treated this as a repression of personal freedom and stopped wearing them, uh, even if this, was, uh, this could lead to a fine, or started wearing them on the, on the chin, exposing the nose and mouth. Um, so the general public in Poland also has low trust in scientific institutions and their communication, um, in part because of the paucity of communication at the level of scientific institutions. Compared to a lot of clamor in the media, with a crowd of individual scientists presenting their individual ideas and strong opinions. And individual scientists who appear in the media often promote what they see as easy solutions, and some of them present claims that their research idea is the one that's going to provide the best solution and, and, and are trying to sell it on the media. Um, and then, of course, the different recipes are, one, are, are, not, are not the same. So the government knows that if they see two Polish scientists, they will hear at least three different opinions. And uh, on top of that, the government tends to perceive scientists uh, mostly as a crowd of used car salesmen, some savvy, some naive, but um, uh, each focused on closing the deal and competing with others and not as a community that can look at science together, work out one communication and communicate it coherently and understandably um, to, to, to whatever audience they are, they are talking to. On the other hand, the government in Poland is used to using scientific advisory bodies, but in the area of policy for science, for instance, um, to, to advise the government on science funding. And these bodies work quite well, um, but they are composed very differently than, than, than good bodies for, for science for policy advice. The bodies for, for, for policy for science advice tend to be composed as to balance different competing interests from different institutions or different geographical regions of Poland, rather than to have best experts on a given topic who, who, who could be available. 
Mm, there is another issue. Uh, policy making in Poland is largely driven by politics. Policy making uh, is, is, is dominated by the politics of the day, and the policies of different ministries can be actually different, also almost from day to day, mostly depending on who is in the office. Um, despite all these issues, the current Polish government is really very good in recognizing the beliefs, expectations, and concerns of the general public, and the policymakers listen primarily to their electorate and to the electorate of their parties um, for decision making. Um, it was quite evident in Poland during the pandemic, which overlapped with presidential elections, which have been uh, actually postponed due to the pandemic, resulting in a very, very long political campaign overlapping with the, with the beginning of the pandemic. And during that time, the communication of the politicians focused on the expectations and beliefs and concerns of their electorate. And in particular, some of the candidates and the policymakers from the government made assertions about the course of the pandemic, that were, which were based on the political goals more than data. Uh, uh, um, about the pandemic. So, for instance, assertions were made such as the virus is no longer dangerous in the summer and it's now safe for the elderly people to go and vote for, for, for the candidate. Um, on the other hand, um, there were attempts to introduce um, science for um, policy advice, um, especially at the onset of, of the pandemic and before the presidential campaign has fully started. The, the, the Ministry of Science created an advisory group on preventing, counteracting, and combating COVID-19 to which I have been invited. Um, and this body has been tasked with both science for policy advice on the topic of the pandemic, as well as policy for science advice. Um, and the body was composed, well, yes, like other well-functioning advisory bodies of the ministry, mostly to balance different competing interests. And we actually ended up giving mostly advice on funding decisions concerning uh, extraordinary grant proposals related to COVID-19 submitted to, 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 to the Ministry of, of Science, which was actually flooded with different funding requests. I think we did quite well in recommending that many outrageous funding requests be declined, and we successfully managed conflicts of interest, which were quite strong. I'm not going into the details. Um, we clearly failed to find a way to synthesize and communicate COVID-19 related evidence to the policymakers. Um, firstly, because at the time of the presidential elections, of the presidential campaign, um, such, uh, such evidence was not really important and other sources of information were more important, for instance, what the, what the electorate thinks. And secondary, this advisory group was not really able and not even allowed to interact with science advisory group at other ministries, for example, the Ministry of Health. So we were work, working closed in a, in, in a silo. And a few weeks after the presidential elections, when the wave of applications for funding uh, declined and there was no longer a need for the for, 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 for this type of advice, the group has been has been disbanded. Uh, yeah, uh, your time is I'm, very I'm summing, I'm summing up. So summing up, the three issues were that mixing up policy for science and science for policy advice did not really work for us. Working in silos prevented us from making impact, and we definitely need a better way of getting scientists together to synthesize evidence. And the uh, Polish Academy of Science has just published a report on understanding COVID-19. The volume and language make it suitable mostly for scientists and perhaps science communicators, and maybe only to a limited extent to the educated part of the general public. But there is hope that with improved science communication to the general public, we can reach the government indirectly, uh, since the government cares about the opinion of the general public, regardless of the opinions are based on science, we need to address the general public with, with, with science. It seems to be the only way under these conditions. Thank you, I'm sorry for making you a little uh, longer. Okay, thank you very much, Janusz, for this very interesting perspective from Poland. So we now move on to our uh, next speaker, who is uh, Professor uh, Tamo Somera, uh, Professor of Marine Sciences and President, as I said earlier in my introduction, of the Estonian Academy of Sciences. So Tamo, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, a lot, thanks a lot, Ole, and many thanks to other panelists who used up a large part of my, my points. Um, I'm formally representing the Open Science Advisors Forum, ESAF, which is an independent network and platform of people who are acting in the capacity of chief science advisors in European countries. Um, in plain English, it means network of people who have national mandate to present science advice systems in sing single countries. 
Um, it has been said many times that uh, the COVID crisis challenged, challenged and tested the value of sound scientific evidence. And here I share the viewpoint that the ability to extract the best knowledge from scientific landscape is actually one of the core pillars of competitiveness of a country or a region. And this is a major reason why science advice systems, science for policy have been created. As my first point, I work to stress that the routine science advice systems in different countries differ radically. They range from well-established offices and routines like the one in the UK, and then up with basically sporadic sequences of uh, calls to single scientists whom the responsible officers in ministries or uh, other government systems happen to know and, and use to trust. Um, and secondly, uh, similarly different countries use radically different approaches to extract and use the best knowledge to handle also the COVID crisis. So some countries already had established scientific advisory systems as part of their routine systems or standalone units. Some other countries, among those also Estonia, uh, quickly established um, an ad hoc committee of structure. And some did that on top of the existing stuff system. For example, Spain has an advisory structure with about 14 people from science, business, and unions, but there was still a multidisciplinary working group established to advise on COVID. So uh, we advise, advise <coughs> we ask the ISAF members to provide a short insight into the function of all those structures. My third point, and uh, possibly the central one, is that the picture is to some extent surprising. Uh, the feedback indicates that the newly created ad hoc structures were remarkably effective, and in many cases as effective or even more effective than the existing systems. So the proof is that countries, even without any pre-existing advisory structure for pandemics, were able to organize scientific expertise and on, on very short notice. It took just a few days in Estonia. This feature may be taken as a challenge for the existing systems. But uh, on the positive side, I would interpret it as um, uh, showing the strength of the uh, decision-making systems in different countries and their connections to the scientific community. Uh, and it turned out that those ad hoc groups um, also in countries without a formal advisory structure, sometimes had very strong legitimacy and support from the general public. And uh, mentioning again, uh, seemingly even stronger than in countries with an established structure. So this outcome hasn't been back backed up by a detailed study yet, but it is at least intriguing. It, it might be a kind of reaction of uh, society under strong pressure, uh, those pressure could be at least mentally relieved by suggestions of smart people or by people who, whom the public um, uh, thinks they are smart. Um, but still, if uh, composed uh, to reach the best response to a problem, ad hoc, hoc groups may be very efficient. Uh, this leads me to the fourth point, uh, which is a really substantial question about the future which is also discussed in other panels in this week. And the question is whether already functioning systems are flexible enough to respond to absolutely unexpected events. Maybe they are by definition less, less flexible to determine what exactly is needed or for the specific crisis at hand. And every crisis has its own nature. So they may have trouble to scale up in time and also may have trouble in, <clears throat> uh, to find the necessary resources if they are created for other purposes. And my, my final point is that uh, a more general impression from the feedback from these of, uh, members is that the uh, effectiveness of advice depends less on formal structures, but much more um, on the mandate given to the particular experts which in a way also defines the power of judgment by, by the groups. And it also depends much more on exactness of addressing the problem, and which has been several times mentioned also today, on the communicative skills of experts and politicians. So my main message is that 
the diversity of science advice structures is part of strength and vigilance in Europe. Thank you. Oh, yes, and the question to ask from everybody. So if we admit that we have enormous diversity of national science advice systems in Europe, then uh, the question is how we could better build on those advice on regional and European level. So I see three different ways of, of direction. It may be a sort of uni unification of national systems. It might be regionally harmonizing the outcome of advice to uh, reduce uncertainty. It might be also uh, driving cooperation in the pro process of production of advice. None of those is perfect, but I would really like to to uh, see um, recommendations from public, uh, Vox Populi, Vox Dei. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tamo, for this perspective. And we now move to the final talk in, in this series by uh, Sir Mark Walcott, uh, as I mentioned in my introduction, uh, former uh, Chief Scientific Advisor to the UK government and more uh, recently uh, Chair of uh, UK Research and Innovation. So, Mark, we ask you to kind of form the final uh, conclusions and discussions and we look very much forward to your presentation. Thank you very much indeed. So I'll try and draw the strings together. And there's been a fair degree of agreement, I would have said, between the panelists. Uh, it was The point was made early on by David, I think, as well as others, that coronavirus really has been one of the hardest cases for science advice. Um, and sometimes, of course, hard cases make bad laws, so one has to be a bit careful. Um, but what are the features that made it so hard? Well, I think first and foremost, because of the enormous uncertainty when it all started, so this was a completely new infection. And although we knew about other coronaviruses, they've each been a bit different. Secondly, because of the severity of the disease in some particularly vulnerable people and the speed of its spread and growth, which is exponential, although the severe side effects occur quite late in the infection in the second and third weeks. And then the complexity of the impacts of um, coronavirus. And I think that's one of the areas that I'm going to focus on a bit. Um, so obviously the immediate challenge is the primary effects of the infection, what it does to you if you get it, um, and uh, those are very, very severe. And one of the things they've exposed is that the elderly are vulnerable, but also uh, it, it's exposed all of the social determinants of ill health. So um, deprived populations, economically deprived ethnic minorities have suffered much more. So those are the primary effects. The secondary effects, which have also been raised, are potential loss of access to the health system because it becomes either overwhelmed or has probably been a major issue in the UK, which is people have become rather scared of using the system. But also the secondary health direct effects, the effects of social isolation, uh, the challenge of family conflicts in families locked down together for long periods, uh, in the mental ill health that's come. And then, of course, the tertiary effects, which are the longer term effects, are the harms that follow economic damage. So increase in unemployment uh, with all of the ill health that brings the economic damage and the loss of education that's happened uh, to young people around the world. Uh, so it may be a simple virus, but the effects are very complex. And one of the challenges for advice, and it's come up in different ways throughout the presentation, is that you need to be able to look through very many different lenses. And policy uh, policymakers in particular need to look through all of them. But all too often you get people who look through a very narrow telescope and see only a very part, small part of the story. So I think, again, the, the principles of science advice have been, I think, quite well articulated. And science is really only a part of the policymaking process. And you can really divide uh, policymaking into three questions that policymakers need to sort out. The first is, what do I know about uh, X or Y, in this case, coronavirus? And that's the science advice. The second issue is whether a policy can be delivered, because people are always coming up with very, very smart policies, but actually they are completely undeliverable. And I think one of the big challenges in many countries, if not most, has been the logistics of delivery. 
And I would say that in particular, researchers and scientists have been very articulate critics of the logistics where they actually have no special expertise. Uh, the role of the scientist is to actually tell politicians the evidence, and it's for the policymakers to work out how to use the evidence. And then the third issue for the policymaker is how does a policy fit with my values, uh, my political values, my personal values, my social values, and the perceived values of the electorate. And of course, the values of different countries are different. And so what works in China, um, which is highly authoritarian, doesn't work quite so well in uh, some of the liberal democracies. Um, and as someone has said earlier, the fault lines have been exposed. And I think one of the big issues of science advice is that scientists who are looking through one lens have told the media about this very vocally. The one thing I would say is that certainly in the UK, there's been more science in the media, much of it of high quality, than any previous emergency I can uh, remember. So there's been discussion about assembling a system on the fly, and David talked about that as well. The UK has a hardwired system. It's a very long standing one, um, and it's providing advice through a committee which has the rather nice acronym of SAGE, which is the Scientific Advice Group in Emergencies. And that is multidisciplinary, and I entirely agree with everyone who said it has to be multidisciplinary. So on SAGE, there are ethicists, clinicians, behavioral scientists, virologists, immunologists, you name it, they're there. Um, and, but I think an interesting question is around the transparency, which is that uh, the members of SAGE do have a mandate to speak to uh, in the media. They can speak in their personal capacity, though not on behalf of SAGE. And the job of SAGE is to advise the government chief scientific advisor, my successor, Patrick Valance, and the chief medical advisor, Chris Whitting. Okay. Uh, but one of the big challenges for science advice is that if you are to advise the politicians, you need their trust as well as the trust of the public. And science advisors who broadcast the politicians through the voice of the media have much less impact on politicians than ones who can speak to them directly. Um, and this is a, a, one of the big challenges this is that everyone has an opinion. Um, and uh, the papers of SAGE have by and large been published, though I think it could have been faster at the beginning. Janusz raised the question of connectivity with funding the right research. And that's been a really critical issue of this because uh, science advice depends on evidence. And with a new virus, you only have limited evidence. And so there needs to be connectivity between your science advice and your funding agency. And my observation would be that actually the countries that have done well are the countries that have been exposed in general to public health emergencies of scale before. And so Vietnam, for example, Singapore, China, SARS, Korea had MERS. Um, and uh, Orton can comment, but of course Germany had the experience of the E. coli poisoning a few years ago. Um, and it's about the quality of the public health system, I think. But the research also has been most effective when there are pre-prepared collaborations. For example, CEPI, which is the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovation, which has been taking an international lead around vaccines, ISARIC, the International Severe Acute Respiratory Infection Consortium. Um, and uh, in the UK, we have managed to achieve very good connectivity with the regulator. And so the recovery trial, which is trying to find therapists, has been successful in recruiting people at scale. Uh, transparency, preprint servers, that's quite interesting. The science has been more transparent. But a lot of stuff has been put out there before it's been peer reviewed. And I'm afraid I think that that's had some bad effects as well as some good ones, because not everything on the preprint servers turns out to have the rigor that one expects in public research. Um, and I think one of the big challenges is the challenge of transparency. And of course, there's no question that the, the, the more you can bring in citizens, the better. But I think there is always the challenge of how do you manage in the heat of a battle where there is decisions need to be made very, very quickly. And actually days matter when you're trying to achieve social isolation. So earlier that's me trying to bring it all together. I haven't got any questions specifically, but I think it will come out in the chat. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, this was a very valuable roundup. And uh, we can now uh, proceed uh, to the discussion. A number of uh, interesting questions have come in, and uh, we will try our best to answer at least uh, some of the most interesting ones. 
So the one I uh, picked to start with, which may be an interesting one also in terms of uh, thinking more widely, is a very simple question. Is uh, COVID-19 a black swan event? And does it matter? And maybe start with you, Mark, since you're on the screen right now. Um, well, emergencies by their nature tend to be uh, black swan events. Um, and uh, if you look at rare events it, 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 in all the different domains, uh, it's a bit like rare diseases. Rare diseases are individually rare, but collectively they're rather common. Um, uh, and actually, we know that um, infection, uh, zoonotic infections have been important in the history of humankind. So I think that one really, it's, it's why actually hardwired science systems are so important. And one of the things that you need are national risk registers. And people need to work through what are the potential risks and think about what a you know, so-called black swan looks like. So the question is then whether, uh, if it is a black swan event, uh, does that have any kind of consequences for the conclusions we draw out of this? Maybe we will hear some views from, from other panelists. Uh, uh, maybe, Christian, would you want to comment on this? Well, yeah, there are several aspects in the chat um, alluding to this controversy between scientific con controversies and political consensus. And I think this plays again to this question um, after Black Swan events. So there have been a lot of preparedness before. There are a lot of pandemic plans in countries, um, but they're just sleeping there. Yeah, at least in, in Germany, for example, we had a pandemic plan and we have one, but it was not implemented adequately and in other countries as well. And if we um, think about the scientific controversies like uh, virologists have, for example, whether the virus is dangerous or not, we don't have enough voices pointing out to the fact that we don't have any evidence on long-term effects by now. Um, because we only have experience on six months, but we don't have experience on the long term. We have some very astonishing um, clinical, yeah, yeah, clinical observations like people having been asymptomatic, but then developing quite burdening symptoms, cognitive symptoms, um, damage to the organs and so on. So yes, I think it is important that we have a coordinated monitoring of several effects of the pandemic so that the black swan um, character of this event uh, will turn out to, uh, yeah, to be enlightened by more evidence. Um, if I could add something to it, this is Artem when speaking. Only oh, you're not unmuted. Uh, Artem, please. Ah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, fine. Um, I think what's important to understand is that uh, each individual black swan is very rare. And that we're going to have another pandemic in the next two years is probably fairly unlikely. That we have other epidemics, yes, we have them all year long and every time, but they were more localized. However, that there will be another black swan coming up, but we don't know which one, is very likely. There are millions of black swans around with a probability of one over a million, which means uh, one or two of them will come along very soon. And I think what's very important, I think, uh, Christiane, you made a question in the end, do we need uh, a pandemic board? I think we would really need a systemic risk board, a board that looks into these kind of systemic risks that have repercussions, not to just one silo, to just one field of impacts, but into many fields of impacts. And that's why they have this systemic um, uh, property. And if you had a board like this, they could see what is common, these kind of black swans, regardless what it is and what is unique, and how can we prepare ourselves better in investing in resilience 
rather than just in risk management, which I think would be one of the most logical process. Audrey, may, may I come in early on that point? Because I agree with you completely. But I think one of the challenges is that, um, so the UK, for example, has a national risk register, and actually pandemic infection was at the top of it. Uh, the challenge, I think, is that governments are great at managing the last emergency and sometimes rather unwilling to pay the insurance policy, which is needed for the next one. And I think if you look at this, this has been a sort of failure around the world, I think, to pay the insurance policy for having good public health systems. And of course, health services are largely misnomers. They're disease services. And the economic models for paying for maintenance of health uh, depend on expenditure on education, on transport, on housing, and things like that. And so I think the big challenge is not only having the risk register, but we being willing to pay the insurance policy. So, uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, and other question maybe we should uh, move to now. And uh, uh, several people have asked about the question of publications and made the point that there have been masses of publications. Some people have sort of indicated that this has been a very positive event. Uh, the immediate speech with which the biomedical community have uh, actually uh, achieved uh, quite a lot. But other people have been critical, and David Mayer actually said something about the relatively poor quality of, of some of the science. So I wonder whether David would like to uh, start uh, responding to this question. Uh, I'll certainly have a go. It's not my specialist subject, but we know. Uh, but you didn't mention it. <laughs> I did, so I'll I'll t I'll pick up the baton. So we've been talking a long time about predatory journals, vanity vanity journals, uh, and the the excesses of uh, uh, in the scientific research process, the, the the publish or perish mentality, which has had some unfortunate side effects. Uh, and uh, we certainly seem to have had a speeded up version of this in the crisis with the sheer volume of papers, of which there have been certainly been some flawed ones. Uh, I even read of one just now, uh, which was trying to claim that uh, COVID was uh, artificially manipulated and uh, with a prominent US political figure behind this uh, research agency. So there's misinformation out there uh, as well. So the problem that we, that we know very well, that we've moved from an age of... Uh, knowledge is power, where knowledge was very expensive to produce and very expensive to disseminate, to a world where there is so much knowledge and it's all available at the click of the mouse. And therefore, the challenge is, is how to find the needle in the haystack, how to find the signal in the noise, and identify which is the good stuff uh, that is going to be the, the solid ground upon which uh, we can stand. So that problem has been known about for a while. Uh, and it's just been speeded up in this uh, crisis. So I think premium skills are going to be these knowledge premium, brokerage skills. How can you quickly find the scientific paper that is both robust scientifically, but also pertinent to the political question at hand? And that is challenging. And I don't think we've yet worked out the ways uh, how to do that uh, efficiently. And the more the volume of scientific production increases, the more in demand those skills uh, are going to be. And uh, these, these, these sort of secondary research skills of being able to do literature reviews, synthesis reviews, evidence reviews, don't seem to gain quite the same professional and financial rewards in the research community that primary research does. So there's some questions there about how we uh, reward people who want to do this important job of evidence synthesis uh, and brokerage and engaging with the policy community, which, which frankly speaking, research funders don't have a bit of value at the moment. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to hear also opinion from a, a younger but active scientist like uh, Janusz uh, Bonicki. But before I give uh, the word to him, I would just sort of as a little joke, since uh, Janusz mentioned that there were always different opinions by different uh, uh, science advisors or scientists, and that uh, makes me recollect an old German definition of a professor. 
Uh, ein Professor ist ein Herr anderer Meinung. A professor is a person of a different opinion. Uh, but anyway, this is not a serious comment. Uh, Janusz, uh, do you have anything to say to this question about have we managed the process of publications uh, in, in the right way, or is there anything we can do about it, actually? Yes, so there are two, two, two issues that are particularly interesting for me in this, uh, in, in this discussion. Uh, one concerning the appearance of, of data and preference on the topic such as COVID-19, COVID and the other is, is the synthesis of, of the evidence. So actually, I have been, um, um, my group together with two other groups have actually published a paper on, on, on bioarchive uh, with our research data providing, providing all the original data together with the, with, with the paper because we believe that this is important to share with the scientific community. And many other competing papers appeared and uh, they have not shared all, all, all the data. I believe that uh, the, the publication whether in preprints or in, in, in journals that, 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 that tend to publish very quickly and introduce uh, um, quality control on, on, on it later uh, is acceptable, but there should be a bigger um, demand on actually making all the original data available, especially in natural and life sciences. Uh, because without the original data, it's very easy to make up uh, um, um, conclusions uh, and to and to present conclusions that, that are not substantiated by the by the actual experiments. This is very important in experimental science. I don't know about uh, social sciences, uh, but, but maybe the social scientists in this uh, in this room could, could could answer this question this question better. So summarizing this part, I think it is a good it's, it's a good feature of the of, of the situation that the publications are uh, in scientific data is being made available um, quickly. But uh, of course, we should not lower the the, the quality uh, control. And there should be a stronger push to publish all the original, all the raw data, so this could be so this could be scrutinized. On the, the synthesis of, of evidence, I've already mentioned in my in my in, in my presentation that this is something that we were missing when we were trying to advise the Polish government on on on, on COVID-19 epidemic. The, the reasons were many, but there were uh, if if there were if there were better tools. Uh, maybe we could do a better job. So I think, uh, on the one hand, there should be, as we have, as, as others said before, better appreciation and also better funding for for, for synthesis of evidence and putting together data and 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 uh, juxtaposing different interpretations of the existing of the existing data sets. Um, but also maybe actually we need some more research to help the scientists semi-automatically gather and 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 and, and flow through the, the the data that is uh, that is available but this is another branch of science and i don't want to go into the technical details of how ai could help the scientists uh, go through the data because that could be a topic of another conference okay thank you very much uh, pearl would you like to comment on this pearl please yes um, very much so. Um, okay, a point has been made. Um, one would be synthesizing across publications and something that I think we have to look at our universities and academies to also better reward those kinds of activities instead of just rewarding original research. That's one. And another issue that's been mentioned is sharing data. And I would, it's definitely sharing data on um, very closely COVID related to the disease. Um, but I would also say sharing data across disciplines to get a better idea of the spread of the disease or the, we are all saying that inequalities are being reaffirmed. Um, how much data do we have on this? Um, are the, and, and another question that we have yet to address is um, we, we like to talk about which countries are doing best and better and we say yes it's the Asian countries because they've had experience with, um, with previous pandemics but I also think it's important to get a good grasp on what characterizes those countries or um, let, let's take the difference between Sweden and Norway, um, two countries where one would say they're quite comparable, but they've also 
chosen to adapt very different measures and the implications are very different. So I think we have to also try and um, think more meta in, kind, in terms of the kinds of questions we will be um, asking and sharing data uh, is a crucial feature here and also rewarding people for sharing their data because it's a lot of work to, to describe your data and, and to, to put them somewhere so that others can use them. Okay, thank you. I think we should also be a little bit positive uh, about the publications. I think there have been actually an enormous number of uh, evidence review published in this period. And of course, what I think journals in general should be complimented about is that all journals, to the best of my knowledge, have made all COVID-19 related research immediately publicly available. And this is the first time, I think, in, in, in a world that this has happened. And I think that's uh, actually uh, quite uh, uh, Im impressive. Uh, Mark, I think, would like to jump in here. Yes, I want to come in on two points. I, I mean, firstly, on the comparability, and it is sort of part of human nature, I think, that people, A, look for blame, and B, you know, want to compare A with B. And I think that we've got to recognise that um, chance also plays, and sort of geopolitical uh, events play, have a big impact on the impact of the pandemic in different countries. And so, you know, how it was introduced, was there any particular reason that Lombardy uh, suffered? Not really. They were just unlucky. Um, in the UK, it turned out the introductions were made by people coming home from half-term holidays in Italy, France, Spain, and there were about 1,300 different introductions in different parts of the country. Cities that are highly connected, so Brussels, uh, London, New York, inevitably suffer the effects of the pandemic more. And so I just think one's got to be careful because, and, 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 and picking up the point about um, there are different values in different countries, as I said as well, and that influences the ability to uh, to implement different policies. Uh, there was a specific question which was raised. Uh, the membership of SAGE in the UK has significant numbers of social scientists, it has medical ethicists, um, and the list of participants is actually published on a government website. Um, and so I think you know people need to look at the facts actually. You're on mute, Ole. Um, can I um, add something to this, uh, Ole? Yes, please, Audrey. Yeah, I would think, you know, we talked just about the role of scientists, and I think absolutely agree that original research is very important, that we need also a more or less a rigorous peer review, even if we are under time constraints. Secondly, we have these review reports, which I think it's very important to have some kind of a comparative edge uh, also in terms of other kind of risks, but also in terms of the uh, uh, external impacts that uh, need to be addressed. But there are thirdly, I think, what I would call prudent judgments. And I think many of the scientific advisors are not there to give original evidence, but to give prudent judgment, to say, well, what is a good way to do with these trade-offs? And I think what's very important, and I haven't seen that very often, is that this prudent judgment gets its own rubric in scientific terms. Um, to say, okay, this is something, it's not an opinion, it's more than an opinion, but it's not really evidence-based research. And that's something in between what I would call food judgment. I think it's extremely important in crisis like this, where it very often comes to the point to uh, balance benefits and risks on different categories, where it is very important that somebody understands these kind of impact or has a better um, enlightenment of what uh, is affected by what, and this I think this kind of knowledge is sometimes difficult to um, make you know, available. Um, and sometimes it's implicit you know, when we have a direct relationship between a scientific advisor and a policymaker, uh, but within the um, I think journal literature, that is something that I think is always or not always, but often missed out. And I would like to uh, you know advertise this part of proof judgment also as a major element of scientific advice. I very much agree with this, Audrey. I think uh, in some cases uh, the scientific advisors have maybe been too pure and uh, not wanting to sort of use straightforward common sense. And therefore, that has delayed, in some cases, at least in my opinion, uh, important measures that could have been brought in much, much earlier. Uh, 
Thank you for the that. Uh, sorry, uh, I think we have we have not that much time left actually, and many people have asked the question that I think everybody has been waiting for, it has been hating for, but nevertheless, it has come in several times, and I think people would be disappointed if we don't uh, address that question. So the question is twofold. We have, on the one hand, in this world, uh, two countries that have been regarded as leading countries in biomedical sciences and also in science advice. Uh, we have to be explicit here, the UK and US, who have done very badly in the COVID-19 uh, crisis. Uh, on the other hand, there are countries that have not had such a strong background that have done very well. And we have also another interesting example, Pearl actually referred to that in the comparison between Norway and Sweden. So are there conclusions that we can uh, draw from that uh, that uh, would have some value? We have approached this a little bit tangentially, but since so many people have asked this question, I think we would be remiss if we did not. And I would like to hear from some of the panelists we haven't heard uh, so much from so far. But maybe I'll give the word to uh, Tamu uh, Somera and hear his uh, view first. Yeah, thank you. As a mathematician, I wouldn't say much uh, about uh, situations where you have just uh, two cases. It's, it's a simple expansion of the um, world history, which has n equal to 1. And you really can't draw uh, much conclusions on that. Uh, but I would like to comment on some other things. Uh, from the viewpoint of mathematics, it might be um, uh, instructive for many that you may have different but correct ways of solutions of a problem. So, and if we look at the mass of different publications, um, most of the solutions are correct. The problem is mostly that the scientific community has chosen to use its own language. It's a dialect which is becoming more and more separated from the dialect used by simple mortals. Here I think Pearl is the, almost the only person who can uh, unify those two dialects and, and speak uh, perfectly in both dialects. And I would like to remind also um, about time scales. When we have a mass of new evidence, and if we ask a simple question, which kind of evidence becomes um, obsolete or outdated at the highest rate? And the answer is, this is scientific evidence, even robust scientific evidence. When the new information is rolling in like a tsunami, it is natural that we think not only about the mass of evidence, but about the time scale on which part of this evidence will persist. And if this is taken into account, it's not a perfect solution to the, uh, to the situation, but it helps perhaps a little bit to, to clear up the horizon. Uh, so it is so easy to compare uh, spectacular cases like Norway, Sweden, but I would like to stress here that uh, actually um, the diversity is here more important than, than we, we can perhaps believe in the sense that the existing structures of advice also, they are normally tuned to reflect the strength of the past, like all the generals are preparing for the past war. And we have to prepare ourselves for the next war. And if we remove diversity, we remove the, uh, for the evolution to be chance. Um, the reason for pandemics, uh, the reason why this pandemic is not a black swan, is very simple. They, um, and then, uh, environment, the ecosystem is driven by a need for energy and hunger. We, in terms of ecosystem, we are food for many, which means that pandemics will come at a certain rate. The question is just which, um, uh, which uh, uh, one uh, will be the next. Uh, so the major message from this pandemic to my eyes, uh, I'm now citing uh, Gerald Haug, uh, the president of German Republika. We have learned now that mankind can do something. Thank you. Okay, that's a very, very positive note. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. I think there's another question that is uh, really uh, 
very important. And, and, and Mark uh, brought that out. Uh, and several other people have talked about trust, including uh, Pearl and, and Christian. But uh, Mark, what was brought out is conflict there is between gaining the trust of the public as a scientific advisor and gaining the trust of the politicians that you advise. And clearly there can be, and I think often will be, a conflict here. And I think that is a very uh, interesting point, and it would be uh, good perhaps to uh, hear a little bit about that. And it seems to be to some extent also a question of ethics. So I would go to Christian first. Thank you very much. I think we have to rethink in science itself how we monitor the effects of publications, of data, and of communication. I think mainly science shapes and frames its communication like we have to inform the public and it's their task to understand what we say. Yeah? And we should use the right language, but then it's up to the public to understand this or up to the pol 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 politicians to understand this. And I think that's not right anymore in times of social media and so on. And it's more than only counting Twitter likes or Facebook likes or so. But perhaps we should think more and follow up on what David and, and Pearl said already, follow up on institutionalized frameworks and mechanisms to really monitor how our insights and the expertise and scientific um, results feed into the public debate and what is made out of them. And that should be counted as well as a good result and a scientific task for scientists and, and for their mechanisms themselves, not only to count impact factors and the number of publications and so on. And I think this also um, refers to the necessity to train, that was in the chat as well, to train scientists to think and talk in an interdisciplinary way. Um, it's not only enough to have access to the dates of other disciplines or so, but really to learn from the beginning in, in studies how other scientific approaches work, how other mentalities work, how other scientific disciplines shape their, um, shape their questions and their answers and thinking. So I think this belongs together and I think this could explain the, the US and UK experience as well. If signs do not reach politicians, then they could go via the public because politicians listen to the public. Okay, thank you. I think Mark wants to come in here. Yes, I mean, firstly, I want to challenge your characterization of bracketing the UK and the US as being the outliers. So uh, the UK's experience is actually very similar statistically to France, to Spain, to Italy. Um, the outlying countries, probably Germany is outlying because it has uh, had much less morbidity. Um, so that's the first thing. I think one's just got to be careful about trying to bracket things. And there are, you know, Brazil has done badly. But as, as I say, I think that history will look at all this very, very carefully. The second point I want to make is that actually the, the, the formal scientific advisors to the UK government, who are Patrick Valance and Chris Whitty, have actually are very, very highly trusted by the public. And they have a very high public presence. I think where people have got angry, they've got angry with SAGE because I think they've wanted sort of SAGE to be publicly criticizing the government, whereas the job of SAGE is to provide advice to Patrick Valance and Chris Whitty to enable them to advise the government. And so I think the, the point I really want to make is that actually when researchers are in a room with politicians directly, and that is the privilege that the government chief scientific advisor has, they have the opportunity to be extremely open with them. And they can't do that by broadcasting their advice to politicians through uh, a Twitter or a megaphone. Okay, I think Pearl also would like to come in here. Pearl, please. Um. These are fascinating discussions, and we have to be careful that we're not going into, it would sort of be like an after dinner um, drink discussion. What's, what's absolutely puzzling is the fact that two countries, the US and the UK, had on paper excellent 
risk system surveillance systems, and in practice, something collapsed. Um, and why um, it has, to a certain extent, it definitely has to do with political leadership. And another would be with, I think, cleavages in the population, although they're much, much larger in the US than they are in the UK. And then I would like to point to another country, Senegal, um, the Economist had an article on it that they're doing wonderfully, and that's because it's testing, 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 and people are um, uh, very much sticking with lockdown measures. So there's a lot more complexity than these very simple cross-national comparisons should suggest. Yes, David Mayer, thank you, uh, Pearl. David Mayer also wanted to say something here, I think. David? <laughs> I just wanted to uh, get around this question of scientists talking to the public and, and politicians. And uh, I certainly agree with Sir Mark that uh, don't expect to be invited to have a nice fireside chat with a politician if you've just published a length of tweets saying that the politician's an idiot and they've done the wrong thing. I mean, that's just kind of basic uh, common sense. But I think uh, that there's a wider issue here is that if you accept the case that it will helpful if science opened up its research processes to uh, much more citizen engagement and deliberative democracy, the case is actually equal for politicians as well. And I fear that we're falling into a trap of thinking what scientists and politicians are doing here are very, very different. In the eyes of the public, I don't think that distinction is actually very, very strong. It looks like the clever people doing stuff to us. Uh, and I think one of the big lessons of COVID is whether it's in the process of putting together the science or putting together the measures, we have to bring the public in because firstly, they know things that we don't know and we need that knowledge. And secondly, you are going to need to bring them with you if the measures are to take any effect, any of these lockdown measures or the vaccine, which is the big thing. We're going to have to bring people with us. And we know that how you bring people with you is not simply a question of showing them a fantastic piece of peer-reviewed science and saying the vaccine is safe. That does not work. We know that your values, ideology, and identity, not only do they shape profoundly your politics, they shape just as profoundly how you see the facts. And this applies across the entire intelligence spectrum. The more clever you are, it doesn't mean you don't see the facts through the lens of your values. We are all subject to that. You know, science is very clever at creating institutional processes that force us to see science through different lenses. But still, as human beings, we still suffer from this trap. So I, I, I think we have to look at this in terms of the general public. How can we bring them into the process, both of construction of the science, but also of construction of the policy, because that is the only sure and certain method to make sure at the end that the policy works, but is also science-based. So in this very, very last moment, I would just like to bring in Audrey Wren again about this potential conflict uh, between uh, getting the trust of the public and the trust of the politicians. Audrey, would you like to comment very briefly on this here in these last minutes? Yeah, I would love to do so, and I would try to put it down in three sentences. The first sentence is, secrecy doesn't pay off. We have seen almost in all countries where politicians try to be secret or had a secret relationship with scientists, but that did not work. The second thing is, hidden agendas backfire. We've seen all the political systems that use the COVID virus crisis for another agenda were somehow, I think, um, exposed to public scrutiny, and I think it backfired. Maybe we know not in the United States, maybe November, but it seems to backfire for almost everybody. And the third thing I think, and I would really like to stress what uh, Mark just said, um, bringing people into the policymaking process just by, for example, giving good data on who's meeting with whom, just bringing in, engaging them into protected measures is the best way to get all those scientific messages across. Involving people is the best way of learning.
Okay, thank you very much. We are already a little bit uh, over time, uh, but I want to thank uh, everyone for uh, having been very interactive, and I think it's been a really very, very interesting session. I regret that we have not been able to answer every question that, that came in. It's inevitable in, in this kind of scenario. Uh, the polling results are there, and you can have a look at those if, if you wish. And finally, uh, thanks to uh, Toby also for having organized uh, this webinar. And uh, well, we will probably uh, again, many of us meet again on several occasions because this is by no means over. We are in the middle of, uh, of, of this pandemic. There will be other events. But what is encouraging is, as many people have said, that science advice is much more in focus than it has ever been before. And that is probably a, a very good thing in itself. So thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, it falls to me just as people depart to draw your attention to one more opportunity that we will have to meet again. Uh, and in fact, the way that Ola just mentioned, this is a, uh, a webinar organized uh, in a week or so by the European Commission. And I understand from my European Commission colleagues that some of the questions that were asked today by the audience, excellent questions that the panel did not have a chance to get to, may well feed into this event and will be taken on by the panelists at this event. So we, I can highly recommend it. And then finally, just to draw your attention to an interview with uh, Sir Peter Gluckman in his capacity as the chair of the International Network for Government Science Advice that you can listen to right now. Uh, this interview, it, Sir Peter addresses many of the questions that have been addressed here today from the point of view of someone who is collecting evidence on how science advice has been used and the impact it's had on the outcome of the pandemic measures taken in different countries around the world. So another very interesting uh, perspective on the same issues. Uh, thank you very much indeed.